everyone, this is Pastor John from Resurrection Church, just giving you a, a new video, a Richmond video regarding the Bible. And we're looking at what books ought to be in the Bible. And so this video, we're going to look at some false notions, some false criteria uh, regarding whether a book should be in the Bible. This is very important because uh, the, the scripture, of course, is authoritative for life. So we read the scripture and we understand it's God breathed and it's God's teaching to us. And so it's very important how to understand the process by which they decided which books ought to be canon or to be in the Bible. And the word canon is a, a word that means measuring rod, uh, a, a ruler, let's say. Uh, and so this is our measuring rod for life. And so, and so how do they come up with the books that were to be included in the Bible? Now, of course, recently there's been movies and books written about how, oh, certain books that were old that, that the church ex excluded from the scriptures and they should really be included. And well, we're gonna look at that and see if that's true or not because, because the church was very deliberate and very careful on the recognition of which books ought to be in scripture. So this video, we're going to look at the false notions regarding canonicity. In other words, uh, some some false ideas regarding the criteria of what book should be in the scripture. And the first false notion is that age determines canonicity. In other words, oh, if a book's old, then it should be included in scripture. Well, that's false. Just because a book is old or ancient doesn't necessarily mean that it is inspired by God or ought to be included in Scripture. Uh, you have a lot of books that are older than the Bible that were not included in the, in the canon of Scripture. Uh, you actually have books that are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, for example, in the book of Numbers in chapter 21, it talks about the book, uh, the book of the wars of the Lord. In Numbers 21, 4, the book of the wars of the Lord. Now, we don't know what that book is. Uh, it's mentioned in the scripture, but that book of the word of the Lord is not included in the canon of scripture. Uh, in addition, Joshua 10 mentions uh, the book of Jasher, which, uh, which was not included in the Old Testament scripture, the first testament. Um, the Jewish people did not recognize the book of Jasher as inspired uh, canon. In fact, you have books that weren't really old that were that were included in the scripture for example Moses the, the writings of Moses are included in scripture even as he's writing them as he's writing the Torah the first five books of the Old Testament Genesis Exodus Leviticus numbers Deuteronomy those first five books which we call the Torah or the law or the Pentateuch well those writings are added to scripture even as Moses is still alive uh, you even have Daniel who is he's in exile, he's a prophet who's in exile, and he's studying a contemporary of his by name of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, and he's reading his writings to just to determine how long this exile will be, etc. And Daniel's uh, reading a contemporary, the young Jeremiah, or his writings are still fresh, and they're included in scripture. And then in the New Testament, you even have uh, the apostle Peter referring to the writings of Paul as being, one, hard to understand and as being part of scripture. Paul is still alive, he's young. So just because the book is old does not mean that it should be in scripture. So that's the first false notion. The second false notion is that language determines canonicity. In other words, just because a book is written by in Hebrew, doesn't mean it should be in the scripture. Just because a, a book is written in Aramaic or Greek does not qualify that book to be written in scripture. Um, in fact, um, many of the apocryphal books of the Old Testament uh, that the Jewish rabbis and leaders didn't recognize those books, what we call the apocryphal books, those books were uh, useful for history, useful for some teachings, but they even recognized that those ancient books that were written in Hebrew or Aramaic were not to be included in scripture or even Greek. Um, and so that's the second thing. So age, just because a book is old doesn't mean it qualifies for scripture. Just because a book is written in 
There's the, the language of the Bible doesn't mean it qualifies to be a scripture. And thirdly, just because a book uh, it, that's written agrees with scripture doesn't necessarily mean it ought to be in scripture. Um, which, you know, in fact, you have that within the Bible itself, mentions of other people's writings, even prophets. Second Chronicles 12, 15 records uh, Shemaiah, the prophet kept records that agreed with the scripture. Well, his writings didn't make it into the scripture. So his writings agreed with scripture, which was good, but it did not necessarily mean that they were to be part of scripture. Uh, you also have uh, the Jewish uh, writings uh, of, of, of the Talmud and the Mishnah, or the Midrash rather, there were explanations and commentaries on the Torah. So you have the law, the Torah, um, but then you have commentaries, explanations, other um, writings that, that agreed with Torah, but they wouldn't even say that the Talmud ought to be in scripture or the Midrash uh, ought to be in scripture. They're not considered canonical. Okay, so just because uh, it's old, doesn't mean it ought to be in scripture and just because it has the same language as the Bible doesn't mean it should be in there. Thirdly, just because the writing agrees with scripture doesn't mean it's inspired itself. Fourthly, just because a book has religious value does not mean it ought to be in scripture as part of the canon. It's good that it has religious value, but you even have some books like the apocryphal books which uh, Protestants like myself uh, and the Jewish uh, rabbis uh, do not include as part of canon. They're, they're included in the scripture in the sense of adding value to history and some teachings, but they're not part of the canon. And so just because a book has religious value doesn't mean it ought to be in scripture. Fifthly, just because the, the, the religious community of the time preserve those books and pass those books along doesn't mean that it ought, it ought to be part of scripture. There's a lot of books that were preserved by the, uh, the, the Essenes and others in the Qumran community that preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they found the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And among other things, they found other writings that are not part of scripture. Um, in the New Testament, you have various uh, New Testament writings that were good, like the, the Didache or um, the Didache um, writings that were very useful religiously, but they were not put into scripture as canon. Okay, and finally, just because a book is quoted by a writer of the Bible, uh, or a, a book is quoted in the scripture itself, doesn't mean that whole book is inspired scripture. For example, in the book of Jude, you have what is called the Assumption of, of Moses, and you have a quote from the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch is not in the Bible. It's part of the apocryphal books, um, but it's not in the Bible. But there's, it, there's a portion that's quoted in Scripture. Well, it does not mean that the entire book of Enoch is meant to be in Scripture. Or, for example, uh, another example is, is Paul uh, quotes from, a, uh, I believe, a Greek um, philosopher or historian uh, named uh, Aratus, and he says in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, quote, for we also are his children, end quote. Now he's quoting from this Aratus, does not mean that Aratus' entire writings should be in scripture. So those are just some uh, some false notions regarding books that should be in scripture and just to clarify um, um, how they went about deciding. So this is the end of the first video. Uh, stay tuned for the second video.